anytime. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on backyard chickens. My name is Jennifer Cook, and this is Kara Harders with me. We're both small acreage management uh, specialists with both Colorado State University Extension and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. We're gonna be talking today about health, safety, general care, predators, um, and some just kind of general basic information about backyard chicken keeping. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the small acreage management website um, via CSU Extension, um, hopefully within a week or two. We'll hold any questions until the end of the presentation. Um, so if you have any questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat box and then we'll visit your questions at the end. All right, so we'll get started. Um, as we were putting together this presentation, which is not moving forward. Is that one? That's what I pushed. Oh. oh. Click on the presentation slide to engage it. Oh. Excellent. Yes. Thank you, Darren. <laughs> um, so as we were putting this together, uh, I kind of wanted to follow a general timeline of chicken ownership. Um, but first off, uh, we want to mention that chickens are generally healthy animals when they're cared for properly. They're not um, super, if, if they're cared for properly and they're fed well and they have proper housing, they generally tend to be pretty healthy. So it's not something you need to worry about um, or excessively worry about strange diseases happening. So if you're just um, practicing pre preventative care, you're going to be off to the right foot to begin with. Um, but before you start, uh, we always want to touch on when we talk about chicken ownership is where you are and how the laws on poultry ownership apply to your area. Um, just because it's so different in different areas, counties, even specific HOAs have different rules on poultry ownership. A lot of times it'll be, um, there's a certain number of chickens you can own. Um, and that's, we're not talking about zoning. Um, your zoning laws might be different, but a lot of places will say you can have five hens or six hens up to that many and then um, you may be able to have one rooster but a lot of places have a no-go rule on roosters just because they tend to be the noisy ones and your neighbors might not appreciate the crack of dawn crowing that that comes with that uh, so definitely look into whether or not you're legal to have them in all those different um, areas and HOA type things that might affect you um, and then secondly once it's all legal, you wanna make sure that you have the different facilities that you're gonna need for chickens. And so if you have uh, space indoors for a small pen, this is obviously most mandatory if you're going to start from chicks uh, because they can't just go outside to begin with. They need heat and protection, especially from things like drafts and even smaller predators. They're just a lot more fragile. Um, and then sometimes you'll need that small pen or a place to put them inside if it gets very, very cold and that's something you choose to do. Uh, so just keep in mind that you may come into emergencies where you need space indoors for a chicken and what you would do in that case. Um, and then obviously is the, uh, the space outdoors for a coop. Uh, it's not ideal to keep chickens inside. I've seen a few people who try to do it too long and it becomes kind of a stinky, almost health hazard type mess. So do your best to find a, uh, a reasonable size coop that you can keep them outside. And we're gonna talk a lot about coops later on. Um, and then what type of chicken you're looking for. Are you looking for um, laying chickens? They're gonna lay you eggs regularly and that's the number one reason you're gonna have them. Are there gonna be pet chickens? There's a ton of breeds available today of chickens and some all chickens will lay eggs if they're hens at some point in their lives. But if they're not specifically a laying chicken, um, a pet chicken makes a great pet. Oftentimes they can be more friendly or more affectionate, but they, uh, they definitely serve a different purpose at that point. Um, sometimes it's both. Uh, you can get a, a bird that will lay eggs regularly and is also friendly. Um, and then there's meat chickens, which is a very different process and um, something that we're probably not gonna touch on at all today. Um, but that's also another option if that's something you're looking into. So housing the chicks, uh, you wanna start off, especially when they're very, very fresh and new with a, um, a pretty warm pen. Uh, the brooder temperature, if you're hatching eggs, is 99.5, so you're usually somewhere close to that when they transition into their small pen indoors. And as the chickens get older or the chicks get older, you wanna slowly cool down that pen so that they, um, they acclimate as they get older and they, they will also will not be needing that hot of a temperature. 
Um, and there's lots of different rules on that. On I know there's a, a chart that says, by the week you reduce the temperature by a couple of degrees. And it's not quite the fine tuned science of that, but it definitely is something that you need to keep in mind that you will be lowering that temperature as they grow. Um, and then having a pen that is warmest in the center or where that heat light is, and then the corners are cooler and that way chicks can, can move to whatever temperature they feel most comfortable in. Um, and then the bedding of some sort, shavings are a popular choice. I know shredded paper like newspapers is also a common one. Um, and there's a lot of schools of thought on the type of bedding you're using for chickens. So the most important thing is you wanna make sure that it's not um, some type of uh, bedding that could be harmful to them. I know uh, dustier shavings, like if they're really powdery type shavings, all that dust in the air can be hard on their lungs. So you would want to avoid an overly dusty bedding source as well. And then obviously if it was something you didn't want them to eat that could be toxic, you wouldn't want to use that either. Um, and then pick a draft free area. So uh, garages or mudrooms in the house are a common place for chickens or baby chicks when they're inside your house. Um, garages, depending on whether your garage is finished or heated or how cold it gets, um, is an important thing to consider. A lot of times garages will have big temperature fluctuations throughout the day, especially depending on the season. Um, so if, if you think that your garage is 30 degrees cooler at night than it is during the day, you're gonna either have to do something to accommodate for the heat in the chick pen or um, try to regulate the temperature of your garage as a whole. Uh, and then obviously clean water and chick starter food. There's a special um, type of chicken food that you feed to chicks. It's got the right nutrient um, content that they'll be needing. And it's also usually broken up into smaller pieces so it's easier for them to eat as well. So make sure that when you buy chick food, you're not buying adult chicken food, you're buying a chick starter food. So. Uh, you really don't need that much equipment to start up with, um, with chick raising. A uh, container of some sort that they can't hop out of, and we'll, you'll have to modify that as they get older, but that, um, that galvanized water trough right there is usually good for at least a few weeks of, of raising them inside your house. You've got your shavings, a brooder light. Um, the thermometer is, um, I highly recommend it, especially if you're new to this, or if even if you're experienced, it's good to be able to look in there and get a visual of what temperature it's at. You can, you can read the behaviors of chicks to see if you've got the right temperature, but it's always nice to be able to look in there and see, oh, we're where you're at exactly. Um, and then the food and feeders and waters in that bottom corner, those are, there's a lot of different ways that you can provide food and water for your chicks, but these are, um, common, easy to use, easy to clean ways that you can provide those to them that have kind of been time tested. I think they've been using those same systems for a long time, so they obviously work well. That's not to say that another um, form that you might find might not be a, a well working method as well. Uh, choosing your chicks. I remember being in 4-H and this was one of my favorite parts of being in 4-H was going through the catalogs and picking out what types of chickens we were going to get that year for our 4-H projects. And part of it's because there's so many different kinds of chickens and forms and types and everything that you can get that it can be a bit of an adventure. But it can also be a bit overwhelming if you're not 100% sure what you're looking for or what some of the breeds might entail. So um, if you have the time and you think you know what type of chicken you want, it's definitely good to research, um, research that breed a little bit just to make sure you know what you're getting into. Um, and so when you go through and you order chicks, generally a catalog or a store will have three different options of a breed. And it's um, between males, females, and straight run. And the hatcheries will often sex chicks and they have people that are very good at it and they're approximately 97% accurate. So you've got a good shot of getting mostly what you want if you order that. And so um, females are generally gonna be your most expensive option and that's because more people want females. If they, um, you only need one rooster to tend to quite a few hens, uh, if you're looking for egg layers, obviously a rooster isn't going to do you much good. Um, and so when you look at the prices on that chart at the bottom, you've got males being the cheapest, females being the most expensive, and then the straight run is, is 
called that because it's just, it's supposed to be a group of chicks that have not been sexed. And so you should have approximately a 50, 50 shot of what you get with that. Um, and I've not read any literature proving this, but I've have experience with various hatcheries that sometimes you get a higher percentage of male chickens when you order that. And that could be that they couldn't really sell them. So they sprinkle some of them back into that straight run to get that. So if you are very hung up on wanting a specific gender, um, it is best to pay that little bit of extra money and get females. But there are breeds that, um, for example, the Phoenix rooster is very attractive looking and grows longer tail feathers and is more ornamental than anything. And so I believe the males might be more expensive than the straight run or the females of that breed. So um, it's just something to understand why they priced them the way they did. And then once you bring chicks back home, it is best to handle them as little as possible. Um, they're just stressed, you know, they, they didn't exist at all 21 days ago and then they hatched out of an egg and then a lot of times they get shipped immediately. And so they've gone through a lot of life changes. There's definitely a lot of stress going on by the time they finally arrive um, at your home and your pen and your situation. So do what you can to touch them as little as possible. Um, there's also health reasons. You don't know if, um, if they're carrying uh, coccidiosis or anything like that. So it's just best to be hands off for at least a while, as long as you can push it off for. Um, and then make sure they always have food and water available. You can see in that one picture, there's marbles in the water. And there's um, there been, uh, I guess, sayings that chickens can fall asleep and drown in their water. Um, which I have heard a little bit more commonly with turkeys, but if it's something that you feel like doing that would make you sleep better at night, by all means, clean some marbles and toss them in their water and it makes it a le little bit easier for them to, to maybe drink out of that and prevents that drowning risk. Um, and then adjust the heat light based on the chick's behaviors. I love this picture because uh, it's got, you know, it shows the a proper chick area. It's got the feed, the water, the heat lamp, but you've also got chicks all over the place in this pen. You've got one in the back that looks like he's he's going to take a nap and he's not after the water. He's just over there probably because maybe he got a little bit too warm, but he has that cool area to go to. Um, you've got the majority of the chicks pretty well centered under that heat lamp, but it looks like they're not really avoiding cooling down to get food or water. They look pretty happy to do that as well. So um, you want your chicks to be pretty well spread out. If you come in and you see that they're all clustered together underneath that heat light, that's a red flag that it's not warm enough. And uh, chicks can actually cause suffocate. They can suffocate each other when they're doing that, especially with some of the um, meat bird type varieties. They'll, they're just a little bit bigger and they can, they can definitely suffocate the birds that are on the bottom of the pile. And likewise, if they're all spread out at the edges, that's a good sign that you need to lower the heat in the pen to help them uh, feel more comfortable in their home. And eventually your chickens will make it to the teenage stage and they're, uh, they're kind of, they look goofy for sure, but they're awkward enough and they have enough feathers to sort of fly, but they don't have the weight of a full grown chicken to really keep them down. So they become escape artists, if nothing else. Um, you'll probably walk in one day and see your cute little chicks um, having developed a few feathers and one problematic chicks sitting on the edge of the of the open topped pen and that's the sign that you need to start covering that top up. Um, so it, it's usually gradual modifications to help uh, to help them because they're still going to need the protection from drafts and small predators. Even mice or rats could cause um, cause some chicken death if they're very small still. So you want to make sure that they're safe um, but also provide a way for them to not escape your um, your careful penning of them. And another question we get quite a bit is whether you should be buying adult birds or chicks. And there's definitely pros and cons to buying adult birds. The obvious pro if you're after an egg laying breed is that they should already be laying eggs. So you're not worried about um, housing the chickens inside your house as they're young or cleaning out that pen every third day because it smells funny and someone's complaining about it. So they can go straight outside um, most of the time. I suppose it's a, if it's the dead of winter, they might need a little bit of, of gradual movement, but usually they can go straight outside into their coop. Um, chick mortality is a, is a pretty common thing. You might lose one or two here and there, but when the chickens are adults, that risk goes down considerably. Um, they don't need an indoor pen. We talked about that. 
uh, fewer temperature concerns, and there's pretty much no risk of wrong gender. So you're gonna, chicks can be hard to just look at and tell if it's a, a hen or a rooster, but an adult chicken should be very obvious. And so you won't get that 3% mix up. Um, the cons would be biosecurity issues as, a, as an extension person at NRCS. I think that is immediately what comes to my mind when we're dealing with backyard flocks is if you're getting chickens from another location, unless you knew that person very well and how those chickens were being treated, you don't know if they could be carrying a disease or maybe the, the 12 chickens that you're buying came from three different flocks, which has tripled your risk for um, a disease outbreak since they're coming from so many different farms. So there's just a little bit of the unknown. Um, another point of unknown is the age. Uh, a lot of times once a chicken gets to adulthood, you can't, it's hard to visually tell unless you're an expert, which even I couldn't tell most of the time, how old that chicken is once it looks like an adult. And so the egg laying hens will start to decline in laying eggs, you know, two or three years old. And so if someone sells you a six year old chicken, you've definitely missed the best egg laying years of her life. Um, but if you're paying full price for her, that could be a problem or a disappointment to you. Uh, flock behaviors, you are more likely to have um, picking and aggressive hens when you're merging flocks or you don't know if maybe, like I said, if it had been three flocks that were recently joined, you don't know what those behaviors are going to do or if you're going to have issues with that. It is stressful, um, probably about the same lines as having a new baby chick brought to your house, but it is a, a stressor that you need to remember that animal's life has changed. And there's an increased cost associated with buying adults since they've been fed and cared for for however many months or years. It costs a little bit more than just the heat to incubate the egg. Um, and one of the things I wanna point out about that is this is a, uh, a Craigslist ad from Blackhawk, Colorado. And they're selling buff Orpington pullets. They claim they're five months old and they should start laying soon. And so they're, Buff Orpington is a great breed. They're not um, overly inexpensive as chicks even. They make good layers. They're good for especially winter areas where the winters get colder. I'm sorry, high elevation areas where they could have colder winters uh, because they're a bigger breed and so they put up with that temperature change better. Um, and they want $10 per bird. And if you break this down, you're going to pay about $2.80 for a chick. I broke down the math of how much it would cost to feed each chicken to about five months old, um, and that would be $9.50. So not counting the labor, the electricity, the housing, or anything else, just the cost of the bird and the feed is already $12.30, which is considerably less than your, their asking price. Um, and perhaps this is a person who realized they could no longer keep their chickens and just wants to get rid of them, but it also makes you wonder if there's something else going on. Perhaps these are the six-year-old chickens that are no longer laying since it says they should start laying soon they're not currently laying so just watch out for red flags and a lot of times if something seems too good to be true it probably is um, if you are buying flocks and you choose to merge a flock we touched a little bit earlier on this um, adding new chickens can cause behavioral issues you'll often have a, a bullying system until they get themselves all worked out which Usually doesn't result in anything too problematic, but sometimes you'll end up having a, a chicken get too bloodied up over it. Um, the biosecurity issue, opportunity for contamination. You don't know what diseases one flock may be introducing to the other. Um, and if you're free ranging your chickens, you're, they don't have that same kind of anchor home feeling to your coop probably. And so if they're being picked on and bullied by some of your other chickens, you might have a hard time uh, getting them to stay in their coop one, before they've been trained to it. Um, and when you're dealing with a large poultry producer, generally, generally they will change out their entire flock at one time just so that they don't have to deal with a lot of these problems. They'll get however many chickens they need for egg production or meat production. And then when they're, the meat birds are harvested or the egg layers are not at their peak production for what that company is looking for, they get rid of everything at one time, which um, isn't always a overly realistic option for the backyard owner who is viewing their chickens more as a pet than a, um, an income source or something. But it is something to consider doing if possible for you just because it solves and mediates a lot of problems. Um, 
and the behave so if you are merging flocks uh, having extra space is generally a benefit to that uh, coop that's big enough for 15 chickens might not be enough space for two groups of five just because they're not quite happy with each other yet um, and this is one of those points that uh, I a lot of times when I give workshops or presentations on chickens I'll have someone say but I read this and this which contradicts a fact and generally they're right there's a lot of things that go back and forth on chicken care and what one for this example would be that the more chickens you have in a coop or the less additional coop space, the warmer they'll stay in the winter because they huddle together and that body temperature helps out. So I um, thought I'd throw that in as a fun fact that generally you do want your coop to be the right size for the number of chickens that you have. So when you are picking out or designing your coop, there's a few things that you wanna make sure about for it. Um, you wanna make sure that it's easy to clean um, since you're going to be ho hopefully cleaning it regularly for many years to come, that should be a big, a big factor on whoever is cleaning it. Um, protecting from temperatures, wind, sun, rain, predators, wild birds. Um, it needs to be their safe space, so you need to make sure that it really crosses off all the things that a chicken needs to be considered to have good shelter. Um, it needs to have good drainage around it. You want to make sure you don't build your coop in a low spot because then when we get a heavy rainstorm, all of a sudden your chickens are standing in inches of water or mud. And that um, not only does it, is that problematic, but it will also make it take longer for the coop to dry out when it does rain, which causes smell issues and disease issues. And you just want to make sure there's good drainage for your coop. Um, and then another touch on space. Generally, you need about one to four square feet of coop per chicken, and this is a figure that is um, varies a little bit from source to source, but I, I like to use this sort of a definition because if you have a hundred chickens, you're going to be much closer to the needing one square foot of coop per chicken. Um, and then for since you never want to keep just one chicken, it needs to always be at least two. Um, eight foot and eight square foot flooring on a coop for two chickens might be a little bit more accurate. But, um, and it's, that also varies on the size of your chicken. If you're getting bantams or those very small ones, that obviously won't need the same amount of space as one of your, your larger egg layers. So use common sense and try to, um, and understand that if they grow up bigger than you were expecting, you might need to be making some modifications. Um, coops can be done in many different ways and there's no absolute best answer in my opinion. Um, there's, you need, there's a few things you absolutely need, but there's a lot of ways to do that depending on your situation or what you want it to look like or how it needs to work. Um, I thought I had a layout. Sorry about that. Um, some of the best things or the most important things that you need are um, a roost for those chickens to sit on. They enjoy sitting on roosts and it helps keep them clean because a lot of times when they, um, when they defecate, they will, um, they'll do it on their roost. And so that allows the droppings to fall away from the chicken and helps keep them cleaner. Um, it's also a natural behavior of chickens to roost on things. Um, having egg layer boxes is good so that they can be trained of where they need to put those eggs. Uh, that's a problem with free range chickens. Sometimes if they're not um, quite devoted to their coop, they'll end, you'll end up finding a nest of 20 eggs somewhere under the, under the shed or an old trailer that you have to then throw away and, and miss not having. Um, but you want a coop that will provide plenty of natural or artificial light. Um, I would definitely suggest the natural over the artificial just because there's so much dust and commotion that can happen in a chicken pen that when you put any source of electricity in there, you're just increasing your risk of a fire. So if you can at all avoid having a heat light or a regular light in that coop, that's for the best. Um, I understand that's not always possible. And if it's not possible for you, do everything you can to prevent the fire risk in your coop. Um, so natural light would mean windows or areas where it's just screen that you might need to cover up in the winter time when it gets colder. Um, Sanitary areas for their food and their water, usually those are raised up a little bit from the floor of the coop so the droppings or um, dirty nesting material or straw doesn't get into that food or water. Um, and then coops that are both predator and rodent proof, a lot of times you'll need to have a screen on the bottom of the coop um, or even the outdoor run if you can so that mice and rats can't tunnel up through there. Nothing will attract rats to a farm like having chicken feed or pig feed around. So keep that in mind of what might be an unexpected side effect of your chicken project. Um, 
And then meeting applicable building codes. Uh, anymore, we're getting so much, so many more strict rules on what kind of structures can be built on a property. And so if it's something um, that's going to be the Taj Mahal of, of chicken coops, you probably want to check and make sure that that's something you're going to be able to build and keep in your, your yard or on your property and it won't count as an additional structure that you weren't zoned for or coded for. I guess I wanted to make sure that you definitely saw that. <laughs> um, I apologize earlier, this is the graphic that I was looking for. Um, so this has essentially all the, all the things that you would need for your, your coop. Once again, that heat lamp is extra um, optional. It's only there if you really need it. Um, so it's got the nesting boxes, feeder water, um, ventilation that can be adjusted. There's a door. You want to make sure too that it is easy for you to get into the coop if you need to. Um, if a bird dies in there, you don't want to be having to tear off the side of your chicken coop so that you can get it out um, or to get in there and clean it. So make sure that the door is not only chicken sized but also you sized. Um, but those are that would be a general layout for an indoor section. And then oftentimes chicken coops will open up to an outdoor run or the door will come open so they can be free range. And however you want to do that is up to you. So feeding chickens, um, feeding chickens can almost even be fun just because they eat so many different things. They're extreme omnivores. Um, they'll even go as far as resorting to cannibalism if we want to be very frank about that, um, depending on how hungry they are. But uh, if they're free range chickens, uh, oftentimes they lay better tasting, more vibrantly colored eggs because their diet is, they're able to control their diet on their own. So they're eating bugs and plants and grains and anything they can find. Um, I remember the years that we had more chickens when I was a child, uh, we had very few toads and I do think that was related. Um, and you can also give them table scraps. Uh, things like fruits and vegetables can be a, a fun variety point in their diet. But uh, for chickens, especially those that are not free range, it's very important to feed them um, to feed them what they actually need. And since when something is an omnivore, it's very hard for an owner to provide every everything they need without including some type of commercialized feed. And that's because they need. Um, they just need a broader spectrum of feed in their diet and types of nutrients and proteins to keep them happy and healthy and vitamins and minerals. And um, it's just a, a lot more difficult. So I really, even if you want to give them everything that makes them happy, please include some sort of chicken feed to, to make sure that they're getting the nutrition they need. Um, so there's also, what of course comes with that is the laundry list of things that you should not feed chickens. Um, and a lot of these are, are generalized. So um, I start with eggshells because, not because they're poisonous or bad for the chicken, but it does start the habit of them eating their own eggs, which can be quite problematic for some owners. Um, so never give them eggshells or something that resembles eggshells because it just trains them to eat the reason you're keeping them probably. So don't do that. Um, junk foods, processed foods, candy, sweet and salty foods, dry beans, um, cooked beans are okay. They don't have the same expansion issues. Um, I don't know why raw potatoes, some of these I don't know why you're not supposed to feed them, but they're on lists multiple times by veterinarians, so just follow them. Um, but yeah, a lot of those odd items are things that you shouldn't give them. Rotten food should be an obvious one. They're not garbage disposals. Um, and then dry rice is one you definitely want to avoid too, just because of the swelling issue. Um, so, and if there's, if you have a different type of food you're thinking about giving your chickens, definitely feel free to do your own research and figure out if, if they should be getting a ton of whatever food you want to give them. Um, but once again, back to that actual chicken food, it's, um, it's just the best thing for your chicken and it might not be the most exciting thing, but it is ultimately the best thing that we can provide that they're not foraging for themselves. Um, so, and there's a chart on the side of different, uh, different ages and the way their protein needs will change. Um, generally, when you go to the store to buy chicken food, you can see they've got a, a starter, a grower, a layer, and all these different types of proteins. And so you just look at what age your chicken is at, and generally, there's a feed that corresponds with that. 
Um, the two supplements that you can consider giving your chickens would be oyster shell, and that's essentially a calcium support for them producing all that eggshell and expending all of that calcium. And then grit is a product that generally chickens, if they are free range or have access to open ground, will not need. But since uh, chickens' digestive systems work with the gizzard, um, they need to eat kind of hard type little bits of hard pebbles or rocks that help their, um, their gizzard churn and help digest that food, which is a whole nother webinar. We don't need to talk about chicken digestion, but you might see grit at the store and that's what it is. It's a supplement and it's definitely not a feed. And remember that chickens are much like children. If you fill them up on sweets, they probably won't want to eat their dinner. So uh, feed your treats in moderation uh, and make sure that that chicken food is the main component of the diet that you're providing. So um, I'm gonna move, uh, Jen's gonna take over from here for a little while and talk about keeping chickens healthy. Thanks. Yeah, so um, Kara talked about the fun part of chicken keeping, <laughs> chicken design, that, you know, all the benefits of having chickens and the fun that it is to raise chickens. So I'm just gonna talk about the maybe not so fun part of it, of like generally how, how we're keeping our chickens healthy and some, ail some common ailments to keep our um, eyes out for. But as Kara mentioned in general, um, chickens are generally healthy and happy, <clears throat> but you wanna have some idea of what, to, what you might wanna look for just in case. Um, so keeping our chickens healthy, in general, we want to keep um, uh, wild birds away from the flock or new birds, quarantine them before you introduce them to the flock. And you can have an all-in, all-out policy where all the, all the birds are here and then they're gone. The place is sanitized, um, aired out for a bit, and then a new flock comes in. And that's a pretty common practice, as Kara mentioned. If you're, if you're traveling from farm to farm, visiting other flocks, make sure you're cleaning your clothes, cleaning your shoes. It's a good idea to maybe have a pair of shoes and maybe even some clothes that you're generally using within your flock um, and you're not taking that out to other areas that you might bring in diseases um, or germs. So generally minimizing any environmental stresses. So we want to protect from predators and Kara will talk about that next. Keeping proper nutrition, cleaning our food and water and cleaning the cages regularly. So what does a healthy chicken look like? It's a good idea to keep that in mind. Um, first of all, you wouldn't necessarily want to compare different breeds when you're looking at chickens and, the, and their size and their body weight. The Sicilian buttercup is a generally thinner breed, so you wouldn't want to compare that to a larger breed. But in general, you want to just know um, that, that if you have to see shiny feathers, bright eyes, waxy combs, and the chickens are active, then they're nice and healthy. They're walking around, clucking, talking to each other. Um, their heads and necks are extended. Um, these are all generally good signs that your flock is healthy. Um, if they're producing eggs, generally, you know, depending on the season and the age, if they're producing um, eggs regularly, then you know everything is good in your flock. So, however, there are some common poultry ailments that you want to keep in mind and understand that uh, it is a possibility that could happen to you, uh, you and your flock. Um, so, generally, these ailments are introduced through wild animals or through other flocks of birds. You could bring them in through maybe equipment that have been used on other flocks or in other farms, uh, bringing it in with new birds, um, and maybe even people visiting the farm from other, from other farms. So you want to make sure that you know that once a disease is within your flock, it can potentially spread very rapidly through feces, dander, and so saliva. And that's how these germs spread. So I'm not really going to talk specifically about all of these, um, just so that you're aware that they are a potential problem. So we have lice, mites, mycoplasma as a respiratory disease. So you might see cold symptoms. Um, in your birds. Merrick's disease is a viral disease which can be vaccinated against. Uh, coccidosis is a, a parasite that damages the intestines and you can buy medita medicated feed for the chicks to avoid that. Salmonella can even be passed into humans, so we'll talk specifically about that next. And then finally, the avian influenza, which I'm sure you've all heard a lot about. There have, up to, up to date, there have been uh, cases reported in other states surrounding Colorado, but as far as I know, none in Colorado, but it is a reportable disease and 
is easily passed through uh, wild birds. But basically, if you know you're fine. <laughs> basically, if you know the smells, the sounds, the sights of your flock, um, you'll be able to notice right away if something happens, so that you can quarantine that bird. So salmonella, um, that happens uh, happens to spread to animal to humans from animals, as you probably all well know. So as a general, really important rule of thumb is. Don't kiss your chickens, especially for younger children who have smaller, um, or have who are smaller and are developing their immune systems. Still, they're very much more susceptible to getting salmonella. So, keeping kissing to a minimum <laughs> and snuggling, and um, definitely washing your hands after you're handling the birds or collecting eggs. And that moves us on to egg safety. So um, for egg safety, of course, we can spread salmonella through the eggs or even E. coli. So we want to keep the nesting material clean. So we're cleaning things out regularly. Try to collect the eggs one or two times a day and discard any broken eggs. Um, if you want to clean the eggs, you can brush off the dirt. Um, you can even use like a little gentle sandpaper. If you feel like you want to wash them with water, use a mild detergent. Um, or even water mixed with some bleach, but make sure you use warm water that's 20 degrees warmer than the eggs because otherwise um, if it's colder water it will form a vacuum and actually push any diseases out to the outside of the shell. Um, and realize that you, we can store our eggs in a refrigerator and it's not a bad idea to do, but it's not going to kill salmonella. It will just reduce it from spreading any further. Obviously, don't eat raw eggs if this is a concern for you. And then finally, if you're using the manure to um, compost or to own your garden, if you, uh, it's a good idea to compost it first um, and to, to spread it in the fall because that limits the option for manure, to, uh, manure with salmonella or E. coli to spread onto your spinach, for example, and then um, have it you know, fed to your family. So in general, as I mentioned, poultry diseases are spread very easily. Um, you can pick it up at the feed store. You can bring it home um, on your vehicle, on your shoes. Um, a new bird coming into the flock can spread it that way. And of course, equipment. So just being aware of what you're doing as you're working with your chickens. So biosecurity, um, that's a, basically a procedure that you want to use to prevent the spread of diseases. So it's a good idea to have a biosecurity plan for your property, even if you just have two birds. It's a good idea to you know, have a general plan in place and stick to it. Um, and some of these best management practices are protecting it from exposure from wild birds, of course, isolating new birds or sick birds, uh, quarantining them away from the flock, using separate clothing when you're working with your birds. And specifically, if you do have a sick bird, make sure you work with that bird last. Sometimes we think, oh, we wanna to tend to the sick bird first, but then you might be spreading that into the general flock as you move through the system. Um, cleaning your shoes if you're coming from flock to flock. And then no play dates, so not, not bringing your chickens over to your friend's house to, to have a little chicken play date. <laughs> Um, some more general um, prevention basics, cleaning the cage and the feeders and the waterers um, daily if possible. I know that's a bit much, but you know, the more you can clean it and sanitize it, the better it is. Um, like I said, keeping con uh, avoiding contact with other birds, cleaning your equipment regularly, or at least not moving equipment from one flock to the other. Minimizing the number of people that are actually having contact with your birds. So it's one thing to have your friends over and, um, you know, having them just visually see your birds. But if you have people actually working with the birds in the coop, um, you want to minimize the number and make sure that they have clean um, shoes and clothing. And of course, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. <laughs> and this number at the bottom of the screen, the Avian Health Hotline, is really important. This might be a number that you'd want to keep on your refrigerator or somewhere easy to come by. Um, the Colorado Avian Health Program is through the Colorado State University uh, Vet Hospital. And we realized that there's not that many veterinarians that work with poultry. And so this hotline was set up. You can call it at any time and they'll help you troubleshoot and figure out what direction you should go based on whatever problem you're having with your chickens. 
And they also do necropsies. So if you have, especially if you have a big flock die off, it's, it might be, I think it would be important to figure out what happened to your flock. So you could do a necropsy. Last time I checked, it was $45 for them to do that and find out what exactly happened. You can report diseases with them. The, the real big diseases like avian influenza are the ones that they really want to hear about and, and have documented. They also run the National Poultry Improvement Plan Program, the NPIP. If you've ever heard of that, if you need to move your uh, chickens across state line, you'll need to have this certification. So they also run that program as well. So what do you do with dead birds? We talked a bit about sick birds. So now what about dead birds? Um, it's okay to bag their bodies and throw them away. Uh, some dumps will take the bodies. You could look at local humane societies or local vet hospitals if you want to try and get rid of the bird that way. I know the, the vet hospital on campus will take um, dead bodies uh, with, for a small fee. And then what about um, unwanted chicks? So um, birds, maybe old hens that aren't laying anymore and you just want to get rid of. There are a few options for that. Um, of course, we wouldn't necessarily want to just let them, you know, open the doors to the coop <laughs> and let them roam off into the sunset. <laughs> That's probably not the best idea. Uh, we can butcher them um, for sure. Make sure you're doing that with someone who's trained or um, having guidance from someone who knows what they're doing for humane reasons and for sanitation reasons. But that's certainly an option. Old hens make good stew meat. <laughs> um, so uh, what other options do you have? You could sell them at a bird swap, maybe on Craigslist. And then there also are a few r local raptor centers um, around Colorado that are always looking for healthy birds for, to feed the raptors. Uh, and then finally, chicken picking happens um, often, and often we don't really know what to do about it. So there are a few solutions that we kind of wanted to um, talk with you today about. Um, so, so pecking order, that's how this term comes from. So chickens picking on each other, and um, you'll notice that you'll have one, one hen that's like the head of the, head of the pecking <laughs> order, <laughs> maybe. Um, so the first thing you might want to check is, are they, are they too hot? Are they too crowded? Are they hungry or thirsty? These are the first really easy trouble, troubleshooters to, to look at. If they're too crowded together, they're really bored and they just start picking on each other. Um, often if you have free range birds, they're not really going to be picking at each other um, as often as ones that are stuck in a coop together. You could try to remove a rooster. You could try to add something like a novel item to the coop, such as an old tire or a straw bale or something that different, maybe a different type of food, um, like a watermelon or something fun for them to eat for the day, just to kind of keep them distracted. So they might forget about, oh yeah, I wanted to pick on the, that <laughs> my least favorite chicken. <laughs> um, oftentimes if you have too much light, they might just be too pumped up and distracted. Um, so maybe even just darkening the coop could be an option. I know that we tend to add supplemental light for uh, the birds to continue to produce eggs in the winter. And while that's beneficial, it might actually be um, a, uh, something that we wouldn't want to do if we end up having some picking happening. The picture on the bottom of the screen is Molly grease. So this is a grease that's a, a equipment grease. But it could be an option if you do have a bird that looks like they have a big sore spot from so much picking, you could add this grease onto that area. It sticks pretty well to the skin. It's sterile. It's not going to hurt them at all, but it does taste bad. And so it will hopefully deter chickens from um, pecking at that same area just because it tastes so gross. So our chickens wouldn't look very pretty with this <laughs> grease on them. However, it could be a really simple solution. Uh, remo removing that aggressive hen could be an option, but not always. And then finally, as a very, very last resort, you could de-beak the chickens. Um, however, if you do this, certainly do this with, with the help and guidance from someone that knows what they're doing. 
All right, so uh, the last section of this presentation is just going to be dealing with uh, some of the predators that uh, could be munching on your chickens or what you might want to think about protecting them from. And I think this by and far is one of the biggest issues that poultry owners run into now is um, the unexpected cunning and cleverness of the things that are trying to eat their birds. Um, and there are so many creatures that want to eat a chicken. When you really think about it, all of these animals have been equipped to, uh, to hunt and you essentially have birds that don't run very fast, have a fair amount of meat, and can't fight back. So they're a prime target for anything that's looking for a quick meal. Um, so we're gonna go through and we're just gonna talk about some of the various predators that could be munching on your, your chickens. Um, and some of the, I mean, I'm gonna talk some about the different identifiers and what might make you think caused it, um, but it's usually not uh, a super definitive answer and you'll see what I mean as we go. So um, one of the most common issues is dogs, coyotes, and foxes, especially in this front range area when you come down out of the mountains. Uh, we have a ton of them and as cities and towns have moved out, the coyotes and foxes have definitely calmed themselves around the presence of people and have gotten quite bold. So uh, a sign of these could be injured or missing adult birds. Um, birds that are killed and not eaten is a common side effect of a fox having gotten into your coop because it kind of becomes a frenzy for them. They originally broke in looking for um, probably in their mind one bird maybe. Um, but they get in there and the, the raucous of chickens as they start freaking out causes the fox to kill one and then jump to the next and kill that one and jump to the next. And so um, when these, especially with a fox, if that's what got into your coop, you might have a ton of dead birds or almost dead birds and then one or two that were maybe eaten or carried away. Um, packs of canines tend to get that hunting pack mentality and now I'm looking at this, I shouldn't have said kill for the fun of it because that sounds dark. Um, but that's almost what it looks like. Sometimes they'll kill things they don't even plan on eating. Um, and they'll generally attack at night. If it's a coyote or a fox, uh, I wouldn't have, ex usually you won't expect them to attack in the middle of the day. We have seen foxes carry away chickens um, kind of at dusk or in early morning, but it's usually not in the middle of the day. Um, and domestic dogs are less likely to do that. So if it, if it looks like a canine attack, but it was during the day, you're, you're more likely to have had a domestic dog. Um, but so many of these are generally you're more likely, and so it would be hard to pin it on the neighbor's dog just because they got attacked during the day. Um, and then foxes will eat eggs as well. A lot of times animals won't, um, some animals won't go for the eggs, but if fox knows to look for that or um, they've been used to eating eggs from other, other bird nests or something, um, that's something they could go for too, which could help identify it. Um, bobcats, once again, they may not be the middle of the night, but they're the, the dusk and the dawn predators. Um, they're very messy. They tend to grab a chicken, so not the whole flock, just one, and do their best to tear it apart. Um, and a good indicator that it was a bobcat or a cat of some sort would be um, teeth marks on their bones. The way they eat and the sharpness and hardness of their teeth tends to leave scratch marks, where a lot of other animals are more focused on ripping um, than biting from the bone. Um, and they tend to only eat the meaty portion, so it might just be the breast meat that's missing and the rest of it's there, what, whereas some other predators definitely go for the, the intestines. Um, raccoons are honorary little critters, and uh, depending on where you live, they may be more or less common than your foxes or your coyotes as a risk. Um, they tend to do a lot more chewing on the whole bird, so the breast, the crop, the entrails, they like the, the whole buffet of options in your chicken. Um, and they'll usually, a lot of times, they'll take them to a nearby location. So you might find a chicken 30 yards away from your coop, maybe not even on your property anymore, depending on the size of your yard if you live in town, um, where, that, uh, where that raccoon felt he was safe to have his chicken picnic. Um, and one thing you can do to kind of deter raccoons is to not keep your garbage cans or your food or your trash anywhere near your chicken coop, because that's usually... They've kind of been trained to go for that sort of thing now in towns. They know that garbage cans that smell ripe are usually a, a free meal. So if you, if you do keep garbage cans out, um, definitely try to keep them as far away from your coop as possible just so the raccoon doesn't see an easy access while he's grazing through your trash. Um, weasels are less, less common overall, but depending on where you live, they could definitely be an issue for you. And the hard thing with weasels is they fit through very small holes, um, kind of 
they can get their head through it, they can get the rest of their body through it. So if you live in an area where you know weasels are prevalent, you're gonna wanna be looking into even smaller um, wiring on your cage or your coop walls just because they're craftier. Um, and then I have not seen a chicken attacked by a weasel, but my research told me that they are often, they can kill animals by biting the chicken at the base of the skull, which makes sense since they're so much smaller, they would need to go for something that was a little more critical than just grabbing it by the body like a, a larger dog may do. Um, skunks, they tend to leave injured birds behind and they love eggs. So usually if you have eggs in the pen and if the eggs are always gone, you've got a better chance of having a skunk attack. Um, and birds of prey, these are another daytime predator that you need to worry a little bit more about. Um, and hawks, sometimes they can take a little bit of the fun out of having backyard chickens or free range chickens because as soon as you see a hawk uh, sitting on a nearby pole gazing down at your chickens, you're, you're no longer happy and content to watch them graze your backyard freely. You're wondering about how you can put a roof over them or screen a cage on top of them to help keep them safe. Um, so, but if you find um, a feather pile is a, is a good sign that it was a hawk. They tend to do quite a bit of picking and pulling as they're preparing their, their snatched chicken feast. Um, and also if you have, um, in reverse, if you're seeing this happen at night, if you're finding feather piles or disappeared chickens at night, um, that could be a sign of an owl rather than a hawk. Um, and a lot of predator issues can be prevented by putting your chickens away at night. I'm sure you saw a trend or I hope I made it clear that most predators will attack chickens at night. So if you can get them trained to go into the coop and then you shut that door on them every night, um, you've increased their chances of survival to a ripe old chicken age by quite a bit. So, um, All right, so in closing, we just wanted to talk about some other resources real quick. On our website at sam.extension.colistate.edu, um, we have quite a few poultry resources there for you. Um, that's a screenshot on the side of the, the screen there for you to see what we have. Um, and we also wanted to make sure we touched on a, another webinar that was done by Eric McPhail. He's an agent out of Gunnison. And he talks about con considerations for raising chickens, um, especially in the mountains. Since he's at such a high elevation, he has a really great insight into some of the specific issues they face there. Um, and that's also on, that's on that resources tab if you go to our website next to the, the page that's opened up there. So um, unless you have anything else you wanna to touch on, we can start questions, which I think there might be a few. Oh, it looks like you have some questions under the Q&A section. Yeah, great. So, um, Michael said, I have seven chickens killed over the last five months, so I'm building a new coop, but surprised that none of the seven have been taken out, rather were killed and left on spot. Um, most had head or neck eaten, couple also had breast skin torn open, but breast not eaten. So being killed rather than eaten, Hawks got two of them, but not sure what killed the others. Um, do you have an idea? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, you know, you gave a lot of detail and I wish I was a better chicken detective. I, I would have to guess just based on the information you gave that it was probably something like a fox. Um, like I mentioned earlier, they tend to um, get in there and then as commotion gets raised, they kind of get excited and go around and kill everything. Um, and then they might only drag off one to decide to eat or maybe after all that excitement, they realize they're not even that hungry anymore. And that's a really hard thing to, to come out and see was that you lost everything and you can't even say that you fed the wildlife. Um, so in that case, I, I, as far as building new coops, all I could suggest is hopefully um, they, they've got a safe place to be at night since it sounds like the type of thing that attacked them probably was attacking at night. So if you can, um, keep them a little bit more protected. And then, like I said, with the hawks, that's a frustrating thing if you wanna have free range chickens because you can't expect to, to put a screen fence roof over an entire acre if that's the size of area that they roam around on. So that's frustrating. And I think, I think that's why we see so many people who have a property but to choose to keep their chickens in almost like a, do like a large high fence dog kennel type, um, dog run type area, it was because they just had seen the hawks get their chickens too many times. So. The chicken tractors are also another idea if you yes. want to be moving your chickens around your pasture, your landscape. Um, make, you know, I'm sure you've seen the big tractors. You can actually make them whatever size you want. Maybe put them on wheels so they're easy to move around and 
easily you know move them around to your property that way but still have them protected from hawk predators and owls it's a good one um, so in terms of supplementary food i've seen cracked corn scrabble mixed grain etc any recommendations um I think variety in a chicken's diet is is fun and it makes them happier. And the more variety they have of vitamins and minerals, the more vibrant those yolks tend to be. So um, as far as recommendations, I don't know if I would pick any of them as being better or worse, just so long as it is the supplement instead of the main food is the biggest thing. Um, I know we used to give our chickens something called sweet mix. I don't even know if they still sell that. Um, but it was like this molasses kind of somewhat coated grain and um and they really loved that but it was a treat it wasn't something that they got all the time so um experiment and see what your chickens like to eat more or what they uh what helps maybe what makes them lay better eggs maybe you see a, a more vibrant tasting and good tasting yolk when you feed the cracked corn versus the others so i'm excited to see you have so many choices to choose from <laughs> um, and then have a hen that is brooding, won't stop laying on eggs, and won't let other hens in the nesting box. How to deal with this? Um, broody hens are <laughs> can be kind of an issue. Um, you know, I don't know. I wish I knew. Do you have an idea? I mean, I've heard things about you know separating them and like putting fans under them or something. I forget oh. exactly what it was. It seemed kind of, I don't know, a lot to me. I, I think if you just sort of let it go, it'll, it'll eventually stop being so broody. Right. <laughs> oh. But I know that, yeah, that's an issue if they're kind of keeping other chickens <laughs> from laying, maybe making more uh, available nesting areas where they would be comfortable laying their eggs. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, this is an educated guess. This is, I wouldn't say this is back to our research, but you might want to try taking that specific, if she's always going to the same box to be broody in, you might want to try like maybe boarding up that box so that she can't go to that spot. Um, chickens are, I love them, but they're not always very smart. And sometimes being creatures of habit, they just, they get it into their brain and sometimes shuffling up their routine can help. Um, and then it, broodiness, I mean, any type of breed of chicken can be broody but there's some that are definitely more prone to it. Um, those little silky chickens, um, there's a picture of them in that breed slide. They're the broodiest things I've ever seen. We gave one a goose egg and it was a bantam silky, so it was almost bigger. You know, the egg was about the same size as the chicken and she hatched it just because that's in her head, that's what they wanna do. So if you're having the same issue with the same hen and it's a different breed than the other ones you have, it might be an inherent problem just with that chicken. So um, I wish I had a better answer for you. Okay, well, it looks like maybe we don't have any more questions. So, <laughs> All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us and um, please feel free to contact us directly too if you have specific questions. Have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>